Welcome to Management 2110's Chapter 5 Lecture, based on the readings from the textbook Management. Um, you can either use the 14th or 13th edition for this lecture. Um, they are interchangeable with the uh, information I'm delivering, and it's by Robinson Coulter, and uh, we're going to get started. Okay, our learning objectives for Chapter 5. First, we're going to define workplace diversity and explain why managing it is so important. Next, we're going to develop your skill at valuing and working with diverse individuals and teams. Next, we're going to describe the changing workplaces in the United States and around the world. Then we're going to explain the different types of diversity found in workplaces. And finally, we're going to discuss the challenges managers face in managing diversity. So moving on with our first learning objective, and we're going to describe uh, various workplace diversity and know how to find a great sponsor slash mentor and be a great protege. So diversity has been one of the most popular business topics over the last two decades. It ranks with modern business disciplines such as quality, leadership, and ethics. Despite the popularity, it's also one of the most controversial and least understood topics. With its basis in civil rights legislation and social justice, the word diversity often invokes a variety of attitudes and emotional responses in people. So what's our definition of workplace diversity? We're defining it as the ways in which people in an organization are different from and similar to one another. Notice that our definition not only focuses on the differences, but the similarities of employees. This reinforces our belief that managers and organizations should view employees as having qualities in common as well as differences that separate them. So diversity has traditionally been considered a term used by human resource departments associated with fair hiring practices, discrimination, and inequality, but diversity today is considered to be so much more. Now, an Exhibit 5-1 here illustrates an historic overview of how the concept and meaning of the work, uh, workforce diversity has evolved. So you look here from the 1960s to the 1970s, there was a focus on complying with laws and regulations. And you think about how this corresponds with the history of America, like what we were going through at the time, you know, uh, civil rights movements. So therefore, you have the uh, Title uh, 7 of uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, Equal Opp Employment Opportunity Commission, and affirmative action policies. These were all hot topics that correspond with those dates. Next, you have the early 1980s, where there was a focus on assimilating uh, minorities and women into corporate setting. Uh, corporate programs developed to help improve self-confidence and qualifications of diverse individuals so that they could fit in. Then you have the late 1980s, where the concept of workforce diversity expanded from Compliance to an Issue of Business Survival, a uh, publication of Workforce 2000, opened business leaders' eyes about the future composition of workforce, that is, more diverse. First, used the, uh, first use of the term workforce diversity was in the late 1980s. Then you have the late 1980s to late 1990s, and then there was a shift from compliance and focusing only on women and minorities, to including everyone, making employees more aware and sensitive to the needs and differences of others. And now, with the uh, new millennium, uh, there is a focus on diversity and inclusion for business success. It is workforce diversity as seen as a core business issue, important to achieve business success, profitability, and growth. You think about what we've talked about um, already up until this point in the previous chapters, when it comes down to uh, topics such as creativity and innovation for sustaining a, a business. And you think about what, how important it is to include everyone when it comes down to viewpoint, um, brainstorming, um, 
you know, being innovative and uh, to help sustain growth. You know, you want to experience that cognitive diversity, you know, the everybody thinking. So the demographic characteristics that we tend to think of when we think of diversity are age, race, gender, ethnicity, and so on. They're just the tip of the iceberg. These demographic differences reflect surface level diversity, which are easily perceived differences that may trigger certain stereotypes, but that do not necessarily reflect the ways people think or feel. Such surface level differences in characteristics can affect the way people perceive others, especially when it comes to assumptions or stereotyping. As people get to know one another, these surface level differences become less important and deep level diversity, which is uh, differences in values, personality, and work preferences, become more important. So these deep level differences can affect the way people view organizational work rewards, uh, communicate, react to leaders, negotiate, and generally behave at work. Okay. So this slide basically depicts the uh, differences between the surface level diversity and the deep level diversity. I'm just going to leave this up here for a little bit for you note takers. So diversity is, after all, about people, both inside and outside the organization. The people management benefits that organizations get because of their workforce diversity efforts revolve around attracting and retaining a talented workforce. So performance benefits that organizations get from the workforce diversity include cost savings and improvements in organizational functioning. The cost savings can be significant when organizations that cultivate a diverse workforce reduce employee turnover, absenteeism, and the chance of lawsuits. And also, organizations uh, benefit strategically from a diverse work, uh, workforce. So you have to look at managing workforce diversity as the key to extracting the best talent, performance, market share, and suppliers from a diverse country and world. One important strategic benefit is that with a diverse workforce, organizations can better anticipate and respond to changing consumer needs. Diverse employees bring a variety of viewpoints and uh, approaches to opportunities which can improve how the organization markets to diverse consumers. So I was saying earlier um, about how diversity has an impact on how innovative and creative an organization can be, which is pretty much um, encapsulated right there in that statement, um, where the employees bring a variety of viewpoints and approaches to opportunities. That's that cognitive diversity, more than one brain function. So why is managing workforce diversity so important? To sum it up, we're going to say people management, because there's three of them, okay? It's uh, important for three different reasons. You have people management, and that is diversity is, after all, about people, both inside and outside the organization. Next is organizational performance. That is, cost savings include reducing employee turnover, absenteeism, and the chance of lawsuits. And then finally, you have strategic. It has workforce diversity as a key to extracting the best talent, performance, market share, and suppliers from a diverse country and world. So many companies are experiencing the benefits that diversity can bring. Here we're going to look at Exhibit 5-2, and it looks at why workforce diversity is so important to organizations. The benefits fall into three main categories, that is people management, organizational performance, and strategic, which we just talked about in the previous slide. I'm going to leave this up for you note takers. I'm going to leave it up for a few seconds.
So the total population of the United States, um, total population is projected to increase to 438 million by the year 2050, up from 296 million in 2005. 82% of that increase will be due to immigrants and their U.S. born uh, descendants. Nearly one in five Americans will be an immigrant in 2050 compared with one in eight in 2005. In addition to total population changes, the components of that population are projected to change as well. The main changes will be in the percentage of the Hispanic and white population, but the data also indicates that the Asian population will almost double. The median age of the U.S. population stands at 36.9 years, up from 36.2 years in 2001. By 2050, one in every five persons will be age 65 or over. So you have significant shifts in demographics at the workplace, um, which basically exemplifies why uh, diversity is so important to uh, not only acknowledge, but to uh, study and to identify the benefits um, and the challenges too. Um, so, you know, the changing workplace, again, characteristics of the U.S. population, total population of the U.S. projected to increase to 438 million by 2050. And what comes along with that are uh, differences in, uh, you know, the corresponding uh, demographics, and it's also going to be experienced at the workplace, which is, um, like I said, it really enhances the need to uh, acknowledge and embody diversity, value it. So you have Exhibit 5-3 provides the projected population breakdown as it is projected to change by 2050, and we just went over this. So total world population, the total world population in 2012 is estimated at over almost 7.023 billion individuals. However, that number is forecasted to hit 9 billion by 2050, at which point the United Nations predicts the total population will either stabilize or peak after growing for centuries at an ever accelerating rate. An aging population, this demographic trend is one of the critical importance for organizations. How critical? The world's population is now aging at an unprecedented rate. So when we uh, talked in uh, previous uh, chapters about identifying the differences in generations and their associated attributes, why it is important for you all as managers to um, know what the attributes are associated with the various generations, how they're going to impact um, when those generations integrate or work cross-functionally in an uh, organization or on a team. Because um, you're going to have areas where the team will excel because of the differences in generations. Um, and then there's going to be times where you may have to engage in conflict resolution. So identifying the differences is um, you know just part of it by embracing the differences and knowing how to deal with the differences um, is a whole nother ball game which you will get out of this course so how much do you know about global aging our guess is probably not too much and it's not picking on you it's just that you know new information has made this and uh, an evolving topic. So we're going to uh, take a quiz and exhibit 5-4. No peeking at the answers beforehand. I'm going to have to trust you and we're going to see how well you scored. So I'm just going to leave these up. So true or false, the world's children under the age of five outnumber people aged 65 and over. Second question, the world's older population, 65 and older, increased by approximately how many people each month in 2008? 
and that's A, 75,000, B, 350,000, C, 600,000, or D, 870,000. Third question, which of the world's developing regions has the highest percentage of older people? A, Africa, B, Latin America, C, the Caribbean, or D, Asia? Number four, true or false, more than half of the world's older people live in the industrialized nations of Europe, North America, Japan, and Australia. And fifth, which country had the world's highest percentage of older people in 2008? Was it A, Sweden, B, Japan, C, Spain, or D, Italy? Now we're going to move on to the answers. So are you surprised by some of the answers? So the first one is true. Although the world's population is aging, children still outnumber older people as of 2008. Uh, projections indicate, however, that in a fewer uh, than 10 years, older people will outnumber children for the first time in history. The second one, the answer is uh, D, the estimated change in the total size of the world's older population between July 2007 and July 2008 was more than 10.4 million people, an average of 870,000 each month. The answer to three was C, the Caribbean, with 7.8% of all people aged 65 and over in 2008. Numbers for the other regions, Latin America, at 6.4%, Asia, excluding Japan, at 6.2%, and Africa, at 3.3%. Four was false. Although industrialized nations have higher percentages of older people than most developing countries, 62% of all people aged 65 and over now live in the developing regions of Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Oceania. Um, and 5B, uh, Japan, with 22% of its population aged 65 or over, has supplantly... Uh, Supplanted Italy as the world's oldest major country. So diversity is a big issue and an important issue in today's workplaces. What types of dissimilarities, that is diversity, do we find in those workplaces? Exhibit 5-5 here shows several types of workplace diversity. You have age gender, race and ethnicity, disabil uh, disabilities, and those with abilities, uh, religion, GLBT, and then there's other. The aging pop population is a major critical shift taking place in the workforce with many of the nearly 85 million baby boomers still employed and active in the workforce, managers must ensure that those employees are not discriminated against because of age. Both Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967 prohibit age discrimination. Women 49.8% and men, 50.2%, now each make up almost half of the workforce. Yet gender diversity issues are still quite prevalent in organizations. Take the gender pay gap. The latest information on the ratio of women's to men's medium weekly earnings showed in the figure at 80.2%. The ratio for median annual earnings stood at 77.1. I'm going to say that again. Okay. The latest information on the ratio of women to men's median weekly earnings showed the figure at 80.2. The ratio for median annual earnings stood at 77.1. 
it's important for organizations to explore the strengths that both women and men bring to an organization and the barriers they face in contributing fully to the organizational efforts. And it's important to note that many companies are grooming more women for the corner office. In fact, recent research by McKinsey and Company found that 24% of senior vice presidents at 58 big companies are women. Significantly different than back in the uh, 80s and uh, previous times, even the 1990s. So race and ethnicity are important types of diversity in organizations. We define race as the biological heritage, including physical characteristics such as one's skin color and associated traits that people use to identify themselves. Most people identify themselves as part of a racial group. Such racial classifications are an integral part of a country's cultural, social, and legal environments. Ethnicity, on the other hand, is related to race, but it refers to social traits, such as one's cultural background or allegiance, that are shared by a human population. Now, people with disabilities are the largest minority in the United States. Estimates vary, but it's believed that there are some 19.8 million working age Americans with disabilities. And that number continues to increase as military troops return from Iraq and Afghanistan. The 1990 was a watershed uh, year for persons with disabilities. That was the year the Americans with a Disability Act became law. The ADA, as it's known, prohibits discrimination against an individual who is regarded as having a disability and requires employers to make reasonable accommodations so their workplaces are accessible to people with physical or mental disabilities and enable them to effectively perform their jobs. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion as well as race, ethnicity, country of origin, and sex. Today, it seems that the greatest religious diversity issues in the United States revolves around Islam especially after 9-11. Islam is one of the world's most popular religions and some 2 million Muslims live here in the United States. For the most part, U.S. Muslims have attitudes similar to those of other U.S. citizens. However, there are real and perceived differences. Employers fear uh, about disabled workers are depicted in this slide. So they have the uh, fear of hiring people with disabilities and leads to higher employment costs and lower profit margins. When in reality, absentee rates for sick time are virtually equal between employees with and without disabilities. Workers with uh, disabilities are not a factor in formulas calculating insurance costs for workers' compensation. So between the fear and what is real, there's a huge disparity. Um, Next, there's another fear, and that's that workers with disabilities lack job skills and experience necessary to perform as well as their able counterparts. Um, in reality, the commonplace technologies such as the internet and voice recognition software eliminated many of the obstacles for workers with disabilities. Many individuals with disabilities have great problem solving skills from finding creative ways to perform tasks that others may take for granted. Uh, the next fear is the uncertainty over how to take potential disciplinary actions with a uh, worker with disabilities when in reality a person with a disability for whom workplace accommodations have been provided has the same obligations and rights as far as job performance. And finally, uh, this fear, uh, the high costs associated with accommodating dis disabled employees uh, the reality is most workers with disabilities require no accommodation, but those who do, more than half of the workplace modifications cost $500 or less.
So I spoke earlier of the acronym uh, GLBT, which refers to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. It's used more frequently um, and relates to the diversity of sexual orientation and gender identity. Now there are an estimated 7 million uh, GLBT employees in the U.S. private sector. Sexual orientation has been called the last acceptable bias. We want to emphasize that we're not condoning this perspective, but what this comment refers to is that most people understand that racial and ethnic stereotypes are off limits, but it's not unusual to hear derogatory comments about gays or lesbians. You know, diversity refers to any dissimilarities or differences that might be present in the workplace. Other types of workplace diversity that managers might confront and have to deal with include socioeconomic background, uh, that is social class and income related factors, or team members from different functional areas or organizational units, that is somebody who works in uh, on the manufacturing side or um, works in the warehouse as opposed to somebody who works in HR for the same organization. Yeah, there's going to be differences between the two. And I'm not talking about physical differences or mental capacities or anything. It's just that what they're bringing to the table as far as expertise, it's just going to be different. You're going to tap into them for different reasons. Um, and then there's physical attractiveness obesity or thinness or job seniority you know in the military uh you know rank can also be a uh you know a difference between personnel or intellectual abilities so despite the benefits that we know workforce diversity brings to organizations managers still face challenges in creating accommodating and safe work environments for diverse employees. So bias is a term that describes a tendency or a preference towards a particular perspective or ideology. It's generally seen as a one-sided perspective. Our personal biases cause us to have preconceived opinions about people or things. Such preconceived opinions can create all kinds of inaccurate judgments and attitudes. One outcome of our personal biases can be prejudice, which is a preconceived belief, opinion, or judgment toward a person or a group of people. Our prejudice can be based on all types of diversity we discuss, being race, gender, ethnicity, age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, or even other personal characteristics. So a major factor in prejudice is stereotyping, which is judging a person on the basis of one's perception of a group to which he or she belongs. For instance, married persons are more stable employees than single persons, this is an example of stereotyping. Keep in mind, though, that not all stereotypes are inaccurate. However, many stereotypes aren't factual and distort our judgment. Both prejudice and stereotyping can lead to someone treating others who are members of a particular group unequally, and that's discrimination, which is when someone acts out their prejudiced attitudes towards people who are the targets of their prejudice. In the 1980s, the term glass ceiling, first used in a Wall Street Journal article, refers to the invisible barrier that separates women and minorities from top management positions. The idea of a ceiling means something is blocking upward movement, and the idea of glass is that whatever's blocking the way isn't immediately apparent. So this slide depicts the different forms of discrimination. And the first one is the discriminatory policies or practices. And those are the actions taken by representatives of the organization that deny equal opportunity to perform or unequal rewards for performance. 
And examples from organizations, maybe older workers may be targeted for layoffs because they are highly paid and have lucrative benefits. Um, next, the next type of uh, discrimination is sexual harassment. And that is the unwanted sexual advances uh, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature that create a hostile or offensive work environment. An example uh, from organizations would be salespeople at one company went on company paid visits to strip clubs, uh, brought strippers into the office to celebrate uh, promotions, and fostered pervasive uh, sexual rumors. Okay, the next type of discrimination, we have intimidation. Those are the overt threats or bullying directed at members of specific groups of employees. An example of, from an organization would be African-American employees at some companies have found nooses hanging over their workstations. Next uh, type of discrimination, we have mockery and insults. And those are the jokes or negative stereotypes, sometimes the result of jokes taken too far. And an example from an organization would be the Arab Americans have been asked to work with other, whether they were carrying bombs or members of a terrorist organization. So already uh, being linked to um, radical Islamists. Um, so, you know, being categorized like that. Um, is definitely a form of discrimination. So next we have exclusion. And that's exclusion of certain people from job opportunities, social events, discussions, or informal mentoring can occur intentionally. An example would be many women in finance claim that they were assigned to marginal job roles or are given light workloads that don't need the promotion. So and finally, we have incivility, um, and that is the disrespectful treatment, including behaving in an aggressive manner, interrupting the person, or ignoring his or her opinions. And that may, uh, a good example of that would be the female lawyers note that male attorneys frequently cut them off or do not adequately uh, address their comments. So those are some types their corresponding definition and examples from organizations. So the fact that federal laws have contributed to some of the social change we've seen over the last 50 plus years, failure to comply with the federal laws can be costly and damaging to an organization's bottom line and reputation. It's important that managers know what they can and cannot do legally and ensure that all employees understand as well. However, effectively managing workplace diversity needs to be more than understanding and complying with federal laws. Organizations that are successful at managing diversity use additional diversity initiatives and programs. So Exhibit 5-8 describes the major equal employment opportunity laws with which organizations must comply. So in 1963 we had the Equal Pay Act and this prohibits pay differences for equal work based on gender. 1964 then subsequently amended in 1972 is the Civil Rights Act uh, Title VII that prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, or gender. And then 1967, subsequently amended in 1978, you have the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, and this prohibits discrimination against employees 40 years or older. In 1978, you have the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and that prohibits discrimination against women in employment decisions on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical decisions. And then finally we have here in 1978 the Mandatory Retirement Act and that prohibits the forced retirement of most uh, employees. In 
1990, we have the Americans with Disability Act, and that prohibits discrimination against individuals who have disabilities or chronic illnesses. Also requires reasonable accommodations for these in, in individuals. In 1991, you have the Civil Rights Act of 1991, and that reaffirms and tightens prohibition of discrimination and gives individuals right to sue for punitive damages. So in 1993, you have the Family and Medical Leave Act, and that gives employees and organizations with 50 or more employees up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave each year for family or medical reasons. And then finally, we have 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Fair Pay Act, and that's the uh, changes the statute of limitations on pay discrimination to 180 days from each paycheck. So a sustainable diversity and inclusion strategy must play a central role in decision making at the highest leadership level and filter down to every level of the company. Now mentoring is a process whereby an experienced organizational member, a mentor, provides advice and guidance to a less experienced member, which is known as a protege. Mentors usually provide two unique forms of mentoring functions, that is career development and social support. The challenge for organizations is to find ways for employees to be effective in dealing with others who aren't like them. Diversity skills training is specialized training to educate employees about the importance of the diversity and teach them skills for working in a diverse workplace. So, Exhibit 5-9, What a Good Mentor Does, and these are all the effective behaviors associated with being a good mentor. Provides instruction, offers advice, gives constructive criticism, helps build appropriate skills, shares technical expertise, develops a high quality, close and supportive relationship with the protege, and keeps lines of communication open, knows when to let go, and let the protege prove when what he or she can do. So employee resource groups are made up of employees connected by some common dimension of diversity. Such groups typically are formed by the employees themselves, not the organizations. However, it is important for organizations to recognize and support these groups. So in review of the first learning objective, Workplace diversity is the ways in which people in an organization are different from and similar to one another. Managing workforce diversity is important for three reasons. First, the people management benefits, and that is the better use of employee talent, increased quality of team problem solving efforts, and ability to attract and retain diverse employees. The second are the organizational performance benefits, that is reduce costs, enhance problem solving ability, and improved system flexibility. Third are the strategic benefits, and that's increased understanding of diverse marketplace, potential to improve sales and market share, and competitive advantage because of improved innovation efforts and viewed as moral and ethical. So in review of the second learning objective, the main changes in the workplace in the United States include the total increase in the population, the changing components of the population, especially in relation to racial and ethnic groups, and the aging population. The most important changes in the global population include the total world population and the aging of that population. In review of the third learning objective, the different types of diversity found in workplaces include age, older workers and younger workers, 
gender, being male and female, race and ethnicity, being racial and ethnic classifications, and uh, disability and the abilities, uh, people with abilities, um, the people with a disability that limits major life activities. Continuing on with the third learning objective, religion being religious beliefs and religious practices, or sexual orientation and gender identity, which is the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender, and others. Um, for instance, uh, socioeconomic background, team members from different functional areas, physical attractiveness, obesity, um, slash thinness, um, job seniority, and so forth. In review of the fourth learning objective, the two main challenges managers face are personal bias and the glass ceiling. I'm going to say that again. Uh, the two main challenges managers face are personal bias and the glass ceiling. Bias is a tendency or preference towards a particular perspective or ideology. Our biases can lead to prejudice, which is a preconceived belief, opinion, or judgment toward a person or a group of people. Um, stereotyping, which is, a, which is judging a person on the basis of one's perception of a group to which he or she belongs. And discrimination, which is when someone acts out their prejudice, prejudicial attitudes towards people who are the targets of their prejudice. The glass ceiling uh, refers to the invisible barrier that separates uh, women and minorities from top management positions. Finally, in review of the fifth learning objective, it's important to understand the role of federal laws in diversity. Some of these laws include uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Americans with Disability Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, um, workplace diversity management initiatives include top management, commitment to diversity, or mentoring, which is a process whereby an experienced organizational member provides advice and guidance to less experienced member. Uh, di then you have diversity skills training and employee resource groups, which are essentially groups made up of employees connected by some common uh, dimension of diversity. So thank you for your participation in the Chapter 5 lecture. Stay tuned for the Chapter 6 lecture. Until then, check Blackboard for the week's activities and assignments.